Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Online Digging Deeper series. I'm Amy David with the Friends of the Sawtooth Avalanche Center. And tonight's topic is avalanche rescue tools and techniques led by a very special guest, Manuel Jenswein. Ethan Davis with the Sawtooth Avalanche Center is going to be moderating a question and answer session with Manuel, and we will get to them in just a minute. So before we turn it over to Manuel and Ethan, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of everyone at the Avi Center to the good people at Rocky Mountain Hardware. For nearly 30 years, Rocky Mountain Hardware has been creating custom handcrafted bronze hardware and accessories. Many of you locally likely know who this is down in Haley, Idaho. And this family owned business has helped the Avalanche Center throughout many, many years as longtime supporters. So we want to say a big thank you to them for being our um, sponsor for this evening. And anyone who doesn't know, the Friends of the Avalanche Center is a nonprofit organization that supports the mission of the Avi Center through education, outreach, fundraising events, and provide over half of the annual budget for the incredible products of the Avi Center, um, from forecasting to weather stations and beyond. So if you'd like to donate to the Friends, we have a Venmo account at sawtooth-avalanche and on the website at sawtoothavalanche.com. Those donations are greatly appreciated and go directly back into the products that um, all of us backcountry users get to use. So the friends are also hosting an avalanche rescue practice challenge on social media where you could win a new Barry Vox transceiver, shovel, and probe kit. That's a pretty big winning ticket item. I know I'd like to win it. Um, and we're also giving away Avalanche Center swag. So all you have to do throughout the month of February is post a photo or video of yourself or your riding partners practicing avalanche rescue techniques from transceiver search skills to probing techniques and strategic shoveling or putting it all together into one. Then post it on your social media tag at Sawtooth Avi hashtag Sawtooth Avi and hashtag Avalanche Rescue in your post. And bonus if you challenge your friends by tagging them as well. And you can enter as many times as you want by uploading it to your story, your Facebook, your Instagram feed, whatever it is, whatever works for you. And we will be tracking that and we'll draw each week for Avalanche Center swag. And on March 1st, the end of our Avalanche Awareness Week, we're going to draw the grand prize winner for that Barry Vox transceiver shovel and probe kit. It doesn't have to be fancy, but the goal is to encourage hands-on rescue practice throughout the entire season. And I bet you'll pick up some really great ideas um, after hearing the talk tonight. So for the main event tonight, we'll be hearing from our special guest who is an expert on avalanche rescue tools and techniques. And to make tonight interactive, you can comment and ask questions with the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or by hitting your raise hand um, button to ask your questions live or add your comments throughout tonight. Um, Ethan will be moderating some of these questions and a few that we've gotten in advance. And I'm going to turn it over to Ethan to introduce Manuel. So thanks everyone for being here. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, tonight we have the true honor to hear from Manuel Jenswein. Manuel is one of the world's foremost authorities on avalanche rescue. He's a native of the Swiss Alps and has done snow safety work in over 29 countries. Using an electronic or yeah, an electronic engineering background, he developed rescue products and techniques that have been applied around the world. He developed the familiar V-shaped conveyor belt shoveling approach and the optimized search strategy for multiple burials. Manuel also invented the Easy Searcher Avalanche Beacon training device, which we are all very familiar with, that is located out at the Baker Creek Rescue Training Park, as well as many ski areas around the world. I've had the pleasure of attending one of Manuel's lectures on avalanche rescue. He combines a deep understanding of avalanche rescue technology and practices with an unbridled and infectious enthusiasm that I'm sure you'll all appreciate. We'll hear from Manuel first, and then we'll have time for questions. So please do take advantage, start thinking of them early. Without further ado, it's my honor to introduce Manuel. Welcome to Digging Deeper, Manuel. Good evening, Ethan. Good evening, everybody. 
you should now see and hear me. I will share your my screen with you. And we will do tonight a combination of um, an overview of the different search and digging methods, transceiver probe shovel with a link to the um, different tools and a little bit the technology and the background of the different search and rescue uh, equipment. We start with something very elementary, <clears throat> the group check, uh, which is uh, closely related to equipment. You should now see my screen. I will move this toolbar here away, and you should see the full screen. Uh, the fully shared screen. Group check, what we do at the start of the day before we go out. Unfortunately, every year there are several rescue missions which um, end up with the fact that the person we try to find does not have a working transceiver and often this leads to a large loss in time because uh, they only find the buried subject with the dogs or with the probe line. And there was a very simple uh, problem. The transceiver was not turned on or it was uh, physically turned on, but one found out it, they have no batteries inside. Therefore, group check is something very important. Group check has uh, two functions. It uh, excludes um, human error and it excludes technical error. And the um, advantage of um, the group check is that it is a different person and a different device which is uh, checking you. So you overcome the system inherit problems of the self checks that uh, exactly in the problem when in the moment where there is a problem with the device, the device does not function properly anymore and therefore as well its uh, capability to decide if uh, everything works properly or not is not anymore existing anymore. So a, a self-check is always a little bit a contradiction in itself because as long as everything works well, the self-check is re reliable and in the delicate moment when things uh, don't work well anymore, as well, the ability to check yourself is compromised. Group check has the big advantage that it's a different uh, human being and a different device checking you. Double uh, group check procedure. Uh, here you check the transmit and receive function of every device independently. When you do only single group checks, you only check the transmit function of the participants and the search function of the group leader. What is a real group check? A real group check is a real quantitative range check. And to make a quantitative range check, the test distance here is one meter needs to be uh, well respected because a quantitative range check needs a um, specific result of the test. We will speak about that in a minute and it needs a predefined test distance. So we have here the um, group leader and in the first uh, phase of the double group check, we check the search function of the participants. When we check their search function, that means for most of the users with a modern transceiver that their transceiver is in group check mode because most modern devices today, they have a group check function. And a group check function is nothing else than a search function, which is specialized on one meter of range and which tests much more criteria than only the signal strength, the amplitude. If you make group check only in the 
search mode of the device, it only checks the amplitude of the signal. If you use the group check function of the transceiver, which is a search function uh, with one meter of range, then it checks the transmit frequency, the pulse rate, as well as the, the, the signal strength. So it's a much uh, more rigid test. So the participants, they are here either in search when they don't have a group check function or then they are in group check. And the group leader obviously has to be in the opposite function. So while the, the participants test their receiver, their search function, the group leader is in send in a transmit function. He passes by in one meter distance of the participants and the participants have to check that on their screen. It says either group check OK, or it shows a distance indication 2.0 or lower, or it makes beep sound, whatever indicates a positive test result on your own device. This is what you, you need to know. You need to know from your transceiver what it says, how it communicates to you that the group check result is OK, is positive. When you have tested the search function of the participants, then they go here to send. And the second step of the double group check is equal to the single group check. All participants are in send and have the device in the final carrying position. The group leader is then in the opposite function, thus in search. And for most of the modern devices, that means he is in group check. To respect the proper search distance, the proper test distance of one meter, best is to hold the straight arm out towards your participants, because like that you're sure you are testing in a distance which is uh, one meter and not closer, because when you test in a shorter distance, you can cheat, you can create false positives. So here, group leader passes by again, or the participants pass him, and every participant needs to show a positive result. Let's quickly speak about what the positive result really means, so that you understand why this kind of group check is a full range check. First step here, the participants are checking their search mode. The group leader is transmit mode, his send mode. If the result is negative, because one of the two devices uh, do not work properly, what can be the reason? Either the transmitter transmits a signal which is weaker than it should be. When it is weaker than it should be, the signal received here is uh, weaker, therefore, the distance indication goes up, and as soon as the distance indication here is not 2.0 or lower, it is a negative result. Uh, transceivers which show yes or no would then sh uh, show no, the group check is not good, or uh, transceivers which um, give uh, acoustic feedback uh, to confirm a positive result will just say stay silent. So you realize we can uh, filter out transmitters which are transmitting too weak. What is uh, when there is a problem on the receiver side, on the searching device? When the receiver has a problem, it will, uh, it will lose sensitivity. And when it loses sensitivity, it perceives the signal weaker than it is. When it perceives the signal weaker than it is, it obviously thinks that it's in a further distance. Therefore, the distance indication will go up. And as soon as it is higher than 2.0, it is not within the acceptable uh, range for a pass result. Therefore, the group check is negative and you will not hear a beep sound for these devices where it's acoustically confirmed. So you see, we really have a criteria on minimum transmitted field strengths and on minimum um, receiver sensitivity. So after this test, we know that everyone could be searched 
when the rescuers apply the search strip width, which they find on the back of their device. And we know that everyone could search for others when they apply the search strip width, which they see uh, on the back of their device. So it's a fully quantitative range check. What you are not allowed to do is, let's say we have here one meter of range and the result is negative. So in the test distance of one meter, there is no signal or the distance indication is two, is higher than 2.0. Then you are not allowed to get closer because when you uh, make the test distance shorter, you can suddenly cheat and you can create a positive result for a transceiver, which has a real problem. So proper group check, always re uh, always um, respect the test distance of one meter. Take home points, a properly done group check is a quantitative range check, which means when the test is okay at one meter, there's no reason to repeat it to 10 meters or at 40 meters, the result will be the same. So no further range verification are required. The group check function of the transceiver is a receive function with a preset range setting of one meter and you're uh, testing a wide uh, range of criteria, not just the amplitude. However, the group check does not replace the periodic verification by the manufacturer. About every three years, one should send the transceiver in so that it can be properly tested by the manufacturer and this manufacturer tests, they include then a much wider variety of test criteria with a much narrower uh, tolerance band. Let's go to the next topic. How do we carry the transceiver in transmit mode? Um, we have to be careful that we have at least 20 centimeters of distance between the transmitting device and metal parts and uh, electronic devices. However, all the electronic devices can stay on. Here we see the transceiver in the carrying system. This is one of the um, uh, carrying methods. The manufacturers are in Europe by law required to sell you the product with a carrying system. The carrying system is, is a very good and safe way to carry the transceiver as long as it always stays covered with at least one layer of clothing. However, when you do ski touring, you woke up in the spring, it is warm, you put uh, many layers of clothing away and suddenly the transceiver is visible on the surface. And then you get caught by an avalanche, then you could lose the transceiver because there are very um, low uh, requirements on the strength of the carrying system. It only needs to uh, withhold um, force of uh, a pull with 10 pounds with five kilos. If it is more, the legal requirement does not uh, require it to, uh, to withstand that. Therefore, in an avalanche, there's a high chance that you lose the transceiver when it is on the surface. In this case, um, it is much better to carry the transceiver in a secure trouser pocket. Only trouser pockets, no jacket pockets. Trouser must stay closed during the entire day. The screen of the transceiver should always face your body and not outside. It's the most um, uh, fragile part of the surface of the transceiver. And most uh, transceivers have today such a leash, put this leash, uh, somewhere to the trousers uh, so that you cannot lose it, for example, while you're probing. How are the rules concerning interference when we use the search function? Now we use the sensitive parts of the electronics. The distance goes up from 20 centimeters to 50 centimeters. And now you have to turn off the electronics at just a cell phone or a helmet camera. The search takes a very small amount of time compared to the entire rescue. And for these very few minutes a search takes, make sure that you are not adding additional, completely unnecessary complexity by leaving electronic devices on. 
And concerning cell phones, you really have to turn them off, not just to airplane mode, because the amount of interference you get from airplane mode is almost equal as uh, the normal mode when all the transmit and receive functions of your cell phones are active. So we summarize in send mode, 20 centimeters minimum distance between metal parts and um, electronic devices. However, they can stay on. In search mode, turn off all the electronic devices for the few, the, the short few minutes of the search, but the very critical minutes of the search and respect a distance of at least 50 centimeters. Why are all these little details uh, so important? Because the avalanche accident is one of the most urgent mountain accidents. When we look here at the probability of survival curve, we realize that the survival chances disappear very rapidly. We have here the black curve, which shows the situation for the European Alps, where we ski very little in forest, but uh, even we lose in the first 35 minutes, about 70% of the lives. Huh? Look here, we are already down at 30% when we are at 35 minutes. So 70% is lost in 35 minutes, minus 2% per minute. Amen. When we oh. only look at the very steepest drop of asphyxiation between 20 minutes and 35 minutes, between, I'm sorry, between 15 minutes and 35 minutes, we lose 60% in 20 minutes, minus 3% per minute. If we look at the Canadian diet data, they ski a lot in the forest. Skiing in the forest is very deadly because when you crash with full speed uh, against the tree, you have a very high likelihood to die due to traumatic cardiac arrest, very unsurvivable uh, in the mountains. Therefore, four times higher mortality due to a traumatic impact in Canada compared to Switzerland. That makes that the survival curve falls much quicker and at 35 minutes. There's almost only 10% survival chance left. So for sure here, minus 3% per minute at least. So every little detail matters and losing three minutes means almost a tenth of a life. Amen. Well, before we before we move on past the interference subject, we have a question for you. Yep. Um, is the metal waist belt clip on most backpacks large enough to interfere with beacons? That came from our audience. The metal belt clip. Yeah. Also, look. You should. You just should just make sure that that transceiver is not very close to it. If you have the belt clip really, you know, almost on the transceiver, this is not optimal. So a few centimeters, I mean, it's a smaller metallic object, but a few centimeters distance uh, you should have, huh? maybe five centimeters for a small metallic object. When you have a, a large metal clip, then it should be more. Hmm? Especially when it is alloy, it's no good. Particularly in, in search mode, you're saying? No, in send mode. I mean, uh, when, you, when you search, the transceiver is anyway much further away from the, the belt clip. You were speaking about the belt clip, right? Correct, yeah. Yes, but when you're searching, you you hold the device a little bit in front of you, then it's not a problem. But um, when we uh, speak about this setting here, huh? and here you would have the belt with the belt clip, and it's almost, uh, the transceiver is almost on the top of it. This is, this is not good. Huh? It should have uh, at least a few centimeters distance. You have to realize that from these 20 centimeters, 17 centimeters is basically safety margin for what happens when you are transported uh, in the avalanche downslope. So the position of the carrying system and the clothes uh, and the transceiver and everything which you have on you will change. 
And the hope is that when the avalanche comes to stand still, there are still three centimeters out of these 20 centimeters left. Because when we have metal parts and electronics closer than three centimeters, then it can really have, have a bad impact, meaning that the transmitted field strength really goes down because the antenna gets either uh, shielded or detuned. Great. Thank you very much for that answer. Yeah, very good. We start searching signal search, the first one of the four search phases. What is important in signal search? In signal search, we are not only searching for transceiver signals, we are searching for, a multi, for multiple signals. In total in avalanche rescue, we look for five signal types, electronic, auditive, visual, tactile, this is the, the probing sensation when you hit with the probe uh, where it's object, and of course the scent, which can only be detected by the nose of the avalanche dog. In um, a transceiver search, we simultaneously search for three out of these five signal types, visual, auditive, and electronic. In signal search, the situation is that we are still further away from the closest buried subject than the range of our uh, transceiver. And therefore, there is no signal yet. We systematically have to scan the surface of the avalanche to receive the first signal. In this phase, there is nothing relevant to see on the screen of the device, and therefore we should not look at the screen. We should look at the surface of the avalanche to see how far am I away of the other rescuers which search parallel to me. Where is the border of the avalanche? Where are visual clues, which are very important? Maybe when you look well enough, you suddenly see the, a part of um, airbag balloon. And it is as well important to have the visual focus on the surface of the debris to be able to move quickly on the debris because in signal search, the search speed is high. You see here the different uh, signal search patterns. When you are alone, it is uh, advisable to make such a zigzag pattern. And as soon as you apply cross slope search patterns, please make sure that uh, here you only make the turns when you are at the very end of the avalanche and not already here. Half of the search strip widths inside of the avalanche. If you turn too early, you leave terrain unsearched. I pointed out because many uh, books and illustrations show that the turn is already here and this is completely wrong, then you always leave terrain unsearched. So we have here during signal search the transceiver sidewise of the head. Like that, we uh, will immediately hear when there is a beep sound, a digital beep sound from a digital only transceiver or an analog beep sound from an analog digital transceiver. Before there is a, a beep sound, there will be nothing to see on the screen. Therefore, ho holding the device sideways of the head will uh, allow that the visual focus is on the surface, which is very, very important. As soon as you hear a beep sound, the signal search is over. The transceiver uh, has now uh, something which you can see as distance and direction indication on the screen. And all transceivers from all manufacturers and all models of all manufacturers give you at the interface between signal search and course search a beep sound. So you have never have to fear that you miss something, you don't catch something when you hold the device sideways of your head. For the remaining search phases, we look here at the airport approach. So this analogy between the airplane landing here on the runway and the avalanche rescuer searching for the buried subject. 
when the airplane is still far away from the airport or we are still in signal search, of course, speed is your friend. When we are getting closer, suddenly the device will make beep. We take the device now horizontally in the center in front of us. We follow distance and direction indication, still full speed until distance indication 10. Distance indication 10, this is where the pilot in the airport approach model starts to see far away the runway and suddenly the priority starts to change between search speed and search precision. Suddenly it is worth to slow down a little bit with the benefit to gain in search precision. And between 10 and three, it's in particularly important to pay attention to the arrows. When you well follow the, the directional indication between 10 and three, then your runway or the first axis of the fine search cross will be optimally aligned above the buried subject. And basically there is no, no side deviation to compensate in a fine search in a cross. So as quickly as possible, we will be able to make a probe hit. For very uh, low beginner level, bracketing is not even advised. When you are on an intermediate level, then do bracketing, do fine search in a cross, make one cross only. And the more systematic you work in your fine search in a cross, which really means the axis here is in a 90 degree angle, the faster you will find the point with lowest distance indication. Until this point, the backpack with the probe and the shovel inside always stays on your back, which means at the very start of the search, the only thing you do is you take the transceiver out, the backpack with all the equipment stays on you, you quickly look on the surface of the debris, when you see this better, uh, it is more efficient to go with skis or snowshoes, then you do it with skis or snowshoes, when you see that um, this is not possible, the surface is too rough, the blocks are too large and too hard, then you go on foot. You uh, would leave the skis on until you are at distance indication three. Here you open the bindings because fine search in a cross you cannot do with snow sport equipment on. As soon as you have found the point with lowest distance indication, you immediately need to put there a visual marker, for example, a ski pole or a glove. Uh, then you quickly uh, mount probe and shovel. And when you look uh, one minute later down to the snow surface, you realize immediately, immediately, this is where I need to apply the probing spiral. And you see the probing spiral is now aligned in a 90 degree coordinate uh, grid that has the advantage that the rescuers probe out from the center in a much more systematic manner. We probe 90 degree to the snow surface. You start here at number one, where you have the ski pole or the hat or the glove, the point at the object which marks here I have found the smallest distance indication. If you don't have a visual marker there, of course, you don't remember where the point is. The snow will look uh, equally white everywhere and therefore always the same happens. The people start to do the fine search again and you lose valuable minutes. We apply the probing spiral, 25 centimeters between each probe hole. You can imagine when you uh, look here at the probing spiral, we have here a vertical axis going through the center and we have here a horizontal axis going through the center. First spiral from an axis, one step to the corner and one step uh, back to the next axis. And every time you are on an axis, you quickly check, do you have the right distance to the center? So 25 centimeter for the first spiral, one distance to the corner, one back to the next axis, 25. One to the corner, one back to the next axis. We end the first spiral, go out to the second one. We are here in the center. 50 centimeters distant to the center. Second spiral, one, 
two steps to the corner, one two step back to the next axis, 50. Very systematic, very fast, probe fast. What counts as a probe hit is when you realize that the probe stops, the probe comes to a stop before it is all the way in. This is uh, the criteria for a probe hit. The probe stops before it's all the way in. When you have a probe hit, then immediately leave the probe inside. Take the transceiver out of the pocket again while you probe. Your transceiver stays in search mode and you put it somewhere in a pocket. And now you need to confirm to your transceiver by pushing the marking function that you have found this buried subject as marked, uh, that you have uh, marked this buried subject as found. The marking function is a filter function and it allows to filter distance information and direction information to be sent to the screen for those buried subjects you have marked as found. In order to show you the right amount of buried subjects on the screen, so these little man icons in the list of buried subjects on the different transceiver models, your transceiver needs to be able to recognize the unique beep sound pattern from each buried subject. Luckily, not every uh, buried subject transmitter has the same pulse rate. One might make beep, the other beep, 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 and this beep, beep, beep. Thanks to the fact that the signal signature is not the same for all the three, the receiver is able to find out, thanks to pattern recognition, how many different melodies there are. Each For each melody, it will put a little man icon in the list of buried subjects. And th this signal separation is then as well the base, which allows a marking function. So consistent and systematic filtering of the signals of those ones you have marked as found. Let's go on. One more uh, step in the level of detail in the airport approach. Now we already speak in a formal way about the search variable of search speed and the search variable of search precision. And you see first until distance indication 10, speed is our priority. And every time we make something slower in avalanche rescue, we, we only do that because we expect a certain benefit. And here in the search, the benefit of slowing down is the increase in search precision. 10 and 3 closely followed arrows. At the interface to find search, we slow down again. The search precision goes up again. And then in the probing spiral, we are automatically more precise as well due to the finer search grid we are applying. Communication is very important as well in companion rescue and down here in the lowest line, you see what is important in communication. Signal 10, one very subject, three meters, one very subject, probe hit, one meter 10. If only these four information would be communicated at very loud voice to everyone on the searching on the field, it would be much less probable that a companion rescue suddenly falls apart from the organizational perspective. But, but without this communication, without everyone knowing, you have found the signal, how close you are, how many buried subjects you have there, and maybe as well how deep the buried subject is. It is important, it is not possible to, to really understand what is going on. And then you see inefficient uh, procedures. For example, someone has found the second and last buried subject, but the other ones don't realize that because it's not properly communicated. You see them still continuing to search because they don't realize everyone is found. 
and at the same time you see that the person is digging on his own instead of getting help by the others. So proper communication with these four, uh, these four uh, criteria, which you see here at the bottom of the screen, very important. Let's stay in the last two search phases, find search in a cross. When you do find search in a cross, hold the transceiver on knee height. Uh, that means that so the surface roughness with all the blocks of the avalanche disappear and it's as well much more ergonomic. As soon as we apply a search pattern, which is based on a 90 degree grid, it is uh, not allowed to rotate the transceiver. Uh, we see that as well in this case, all the screens look in the same direction because the rescuer has always held the device in the same orientation. When there are more rescuers than buried objects, you will very often see that multiple rescuers go to the same person and often they unfortunately try to find the same transmitter, the same person simultaneously. And at the end in the last square meter, they uh, all search in a very inefficient manner. It would be much better if you realize, oh, I'm getting really close. You communicate that here, huh? three meter, one signal. I search, you start uh, digging. You have your distance information, four, eight, two, eight, one, seven, one, nine, one, seven. You try in this direction, two, one, wrong direction. One eight, one five, one six, one five, one five. You're already very close. Now you take, for example, your ski pole, put the ski pole here, one meter down slope of the suspected target area. You didn't fully finish your fine search in across yet, but you realize you're very close. Immediately put in here a ski pole or uh, just an object to tell them, here, start digging. So while they start digging here full speed and move snow, which needs to go away anyway, you have now another two minutes here to properly finalize your fine search in a cross. Then you apply the probing spiral. A little bit later, you have here a probe hit. In the meantime, they have already excavated one and a half cube meters of snow. At this time, you integrate uh, as well in the snow conveyor belt and you start digging. In total, you maybe have uh, gained two to three minutes. You were two to three minutes faster, between six and 10% more survival chance. Do we have questions up to now? We do, yeah. Can you clarify a little bit for our audience um, why, when you're in your fine search, would you search above the snow surface rather than directly over the snow surface? Can you touch on that again? Yeah. Look. When you have here blocks and you go around, the, you hold it really on the snow surface. Sometimes here you have a low number because the, the, the transmitter is here on the other side. Then you need to go up because the block goes up, the number gets higher. So you get stuck here with a slightly lower number, but in reality, the transmitter is here on the other side. And uh, when you hold the device here on knee height, you have like an artificial search plane above all these blocks, which means you will find the absolute lowest point, which would in this case be back here, huh? the transmitter is here. You will find it uh, quicker and more systematic. And it's as well more ergonomic. Uh, when you uh, hold the device on knee height, mo oh, most searchers are able to walk backward and forward with the device on the same height. Whereas uh, when you have it on the snow surface, for most people, 
the problem is that as long as they walk forward, they're really, really able to have it close to the snow surface. While going forward, they memorize the closest distance indication, let's say 1.1. One one. Now they have to walk backward on the same axis. When walking backward, it's even less ergonomic. So they hold the receiver a little bit more above the snow surface. Therefore, they don't find the same low point again, and they lose time. Today, I see that a lot of people walk too slow in sign search in the cross. At the very beginning of digital devices, digital uh, distance and direction readout, we have the problem that people were searching too far. Now one has told them for 25 years to go slow. Now they really go too slow. And one has to tell them, look, we still need, we still need to try to find people alive. So you have to speed up a little bit. I, I walk here uh, in a slow and steady speed, but I don't do something like 10 centimeters uh, in 10 seconds. This is by far too slow. Huh? I do, uh, do maybe 50 centimeters a second. Huh? You have to realize as well, we are searching a human body and not the matchbox. And as soon as you realize you're only optimizing the fine search precision to gain 20 or 30 centimeters, this is a total waste of time. Then it's much better to start probing. Great, thank you. We don't, uh, looks like we do have a hand raised here. Okay. Amy, can you uh, let Ryan talk there? Yeah, definitely one moment. Stand by. Okay, Ryan, I think if you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? You can. Yes. Great, hi Manuel. Um, hey, could you explain, um, you know, beacon technology has changed a lot over the years. Um, why is it so important to have a modern beacon? Um, what's a continuous carrier? And, and what's the typical lifespan of, a, of an avalanche beacon? Also, look, um... Why is it important to have a modern transceiver? Um, today, we uh, consider the minimum standard uh, transceiver, which has three antennas and a proper marking function. Huh? And um, that makes sure that there are no uh, problems related to burial depths because a triple antenna device captures the component of depths, so the, the three-dimensional component of the search uh, equally well as the other components. Then a marking function is important uh, so that when there is more than one buried subject uh, and you can really lose or gain a lot, uh, the device can optimally support you. When we look at the first generation of uh, digital devices, for example, then they often were two antenna only, or they had no marking function. Therefore, we could support, or the transceiver could support the rescuer, the companion rescuer in a very stressful situation uh, where you lose two to three percent survival chances every minute, uh, much less. You were speaking about things like continuous carriers. Uh, this is related uh, to devices uh, which are very, very old. Uh, as soon as you have a device which uh, fulfills the criteria, three antennas and marking function, all these very, very old problems are completely gone. And today we are in the good situation that from every manufacturer, or from, from most, not every, but from most manufacturers, you can buy uh, even in the lower price range, 
transceivers which fulfill this minimum requirements, triple antenna and marking function. And why in general one should buy a good transceiver? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a potentially life-saving device. Uh, it is as well the truth that the cheapest device is, of course, supporting you less because the engineer uh, was only allowed to use less time to develop it and was forced to choose the cheapest uh, component or the cheaper components. So like it is with most uh, products, the cheapest products are not cheaper because they are better. They are cheaper because they are truly cheaper. They are less good in quality. Uh, they are less user-friendly and in particular they're less user error tolerance. User error tolerance is for example something which costs a lot of money in the development of a transceiver. So if you buy from a manufacturer the more expensive model, this is as well the model which can support the user better. This is the model which can as well recognize better when you made a mistake in your search and can maybe correct the problem because it can tell you directly, be careful, the, you have to turn around 180 degree, degrees, That's a, a more reliable marking function because it has a better signal separation and a signal um, a, or the pattern, uh, pattern recognition algorithms. So yes, it is totally worth to buy um, a good transceiver because a good transceiver supports you more efficiently in a very time critical situation for the life of the friends you are searching for. And therefore it's not a good idea to uh, save $100 on a transceiver uh, which you can easily use for 10 years. That was the second part or the third part of your question for how long can you use the transceiver. Most important thing is test the transceiver uh, about every three years. You find in the, user manu uh, in the user manual of the manufacturer, you find what is the um, recommended testing uh, cycle. For most of it, it's three years. There are sports shops which offer the testing and otherwise you have to send it in. This is something you do over the summertime. Most severe failures uh, of transceivers are today seen in relation to the batteries. Try to uh, buy a good quality, expensive uh, alkaline batteries, especially when you use alkaline batteries, which are in general not doing very good in the cold. The cheapest batteries are really, really bad. And the cheaper the battery, uh, the higher the likelihood is as well that they start leaking. And when the batteries have leaked, then the device becomes completely unreliable and it's not covered by warranty. So only use the, bat the alkaline batteries down to 40%, then you replace them. Uh, Never leave the batteries in over the summertime because towards the end of the winter, the batteries are usually quite decharged and when they only have a, um, low remaining battery capacity, the likelihood that the battery leaks is much greater. Take the batteries out every three uh, years, you send the device in for a manufacturer's test. Uh, yeah, to treat the device with care. And then you can easily use a device 10, 12 years, but it needs to be tested frequently and you, you need to handle it with care. And when you make such a strategy, use it for a long time, be careful with it, then it's as well worse to spend 100, 150 dollars more on a really uh, good device. So not the cheapest device of the manufacturer you like, but maybe the more expensive device because the more expensive device, like the more expensive battery, it is a better quality device. It supports you better. It is more reliable. Cheaper is not better. Cheaper is truly cheaper. Thank you for that answer. And, and kind of on that vein, 
if you're comfortable sharing with us, what's your favorite beacon? Um, and then on down the line, your sh favorite shovel and your favorite probe. Look, um, concerning the transceiver, it really depends a little bit on the user group. When you are a professional user, you should buy a transceiver which still supports analog sound. Because analog sound, so the access to the raw data where you can really listen what is going on in this search scenario is a very valuable information and it makes the search much more reliable. When you are a professional user, you need as well to be able to keep all your communication devices turned on while you're searching. That includes a lot of um, interference. This interference will lead to false positives, so distance and direction indications which are not uh, triggered by a transmitter on a buried subject, but uh, just from an interference coming from your radio. And uh, for these situations, analog sound is highly uh, useful to quickly distinguish between a false positive and the real signal, as well when we have complex multiple burial situations, analog sound is a great advantage. However, to really take advantage of this, you need a lot of training. And the normal recreational user does not have this training. And it is as well not very important uh, because he can switch off all the uh, disturbing devices in the few minutes the search of the buried subject will take for him. Therefore, as a recreational user, you should really follow the advice minimum triple antenna and the device absolutely needs a proper marking function. So devices who do not have proper marking functions, they should not be considered. And there is obviously a manufacturer which does not have that. And um, it is the compromise uh, over all the large organizations that this is insufficient. You need triple antenna and the proper marking function in the very critical situation where you have more than one buried subject, this can uh, decide between death and uh, uh, survival because the device supports you better with a marking function. I think this is what is important to say concerning the transceiver, probe and shovel. I just developed for the UIAA Safety Commission a uh, new standard for uh, probes and shovels. And when you buy a um, product with the UIAA safety label, I can show you this quickly. Then you are really sure that this product is tested to a high quality standard. So this is here, the web page of the UIAA. The UIAA is the International Federation of All Alpine Clubs. It uh, represents the interests of the 4.2 million Alpine Club members worldwide. And when you go here to safety and you go to safety, resources and you go here for uh, certified equipment. You can uh, select here, uh, for example, you want to search for snow shovels or you want to uh, select for probes. At the moment, you already find about uh, 20 avalanche shovels, which are UIAA safety label uh, qualified, they're certified. When you buy such a product, you are really sure that it has been tested on a standard, which makes sure that the product fulfills the ergonomic uh, criteria and the, the mechanical 
uh, rigidity, it needs to be an efficient lifesaver. We only finished the show, uh, the, we only finished the standard of the probes last summer. Therefore, there are no probes available on the market yet. However, this fall, the first probes which are uh, qualified, which are certified with the UIAA safety label, will be will be available. And the the safety label which you will see on the on the product. I should see it somewhere here. Change the web page so many times until we don't see it anymore. Ah, let's go here to safety label standards. So this is the safety label, huh? And the product has this on, and that you see, for example, on your climbing ropes, on your climbing helmets, on your climbing harnesses, then it has been certified. And today, look, if you would have asked me this question five years ago, it would have been much harder uh, to uh, answer the question because there were no objective standards for probes and for shovels. But today it is very uh, easy. I can tell you by, by a UIAA certified probe and shovel, and then you uh, are sure that it fulfills all the important criteria. You don't need to read 20 different gear reviews uh, to find out which product could be better and which uh, product is worse. Buy a certified product and you are sure that uh, the product fulfills the criteria. Here you can as well, uh, by the way, read a little bit how we uh, developed the standard and so on. And uh, then you, you see it and you can as well read what, uh, what, this, what the standard uh, includes. Huh? So this is, for example, such a standard, huh? and you will see all the requirements we have put in for the probes, for example, as well. Uh, it is required that it has a minimum length of uh, two meter forty. We put as well in here a minimum diameter requirement. I can put that in here. Let's scroll down. So you see two meter 40 lengths is the minimum criteria, then 11 millimeter diameter is the minimum criteria. Thinner probes simply don't have enough axial stiffness and axial stiffness is a very important um, efficiency, but as well safety criteria. So we are in a much better situation today to answer your question, uh, what is a good probe and what is a good shovel by certified equipment. There are many manufacturers today who see the advantage of it. And um, I quickly uh, stop the sharing of the screen. And I'll show you a product of the Avalanche shovel. This is, for example, here, a certified shovel. I'm, I'm just testing now all the light, the most lightweight uh, products which fall below the standard. Because, you know, even when you created the standard, sometimes you want to make sure that uh, <laughs> the standard really uh, leads to what you want. Here, a shovel, which is 440 grams, so less than one pound. And I'm using it now already for several courses. And it has a telescopic handle because we specified the minimum length uh, to be 75 centimeters. That's an important, um, it's an important ergonomic requirement when the 
total length is shorter, very strenuous to shovel. We uh, specified as well the minimum blade size, 440 gram, really um, uh, good shovel from what I see for now. It really fulfills the rigidity, mechanical stiffness criteria. And you see here on it, let's look for it. Oh, I'm sorry, UIAA safety label. There you see it. This is what you need to look for. The manufacturer doesn't matter. As long as they need to fulfill the same uh, criteria, you're sure it fulfills um, the requirements to be a reliable, long-lasting product. And this is my answer. I made, I made, I assisted uh, heavily in the creation of the two, sta two standards today. The mountaineers, recreational users, but as well professional users, don't need to read 22 gear reviews anymore and then they still buy the wrong product today. You buy the product where you see the safety label and you are sure the product will fulfill all the essential requirements. What, you, what is not important for an avalanche shovel is by the way, this backhoe function, uh, our large scale tests clearly uh, show that you lose about 18% efficiency uh, when you use the product in this backhoe position because the avalanche shovel in this position is much less versatile, which means it's only good when the, you, there is a loose snow, but there is not only loose snow in an avalanche. And as soon as there is no more loose snow, you need to change the position again. And then after the second time, the locking mechanism ices up and you lose a lot of time. So use the shovel in the normal uh, position here. Then you can either uh, paddle snow, you can coop, scoop snow, or you can cut blocks. And uh, for that, only one shovel position is necessary. Do we have other questions? Yeah, great. Thank you for that uh, answer. And thanks for your work on those standards too. That really helps out the consumer. Um, we do have another question about pertaining to, to beacons. So yeah. can you explain the difference between marking and masking? Mm, I don't. I don't really see the, what the difference would be. Look, there is one manufacturer which offers a so-called signal suppression feature, which only allows um, uh, to uh, filter out. And if this filtering is now, uh, uh, is now perceived as masking or marking, doesn't matter, that which is only allowed to filter the strongest signal, then this is not a genuine marking function. Um, a genuine marking function allows to uh, filter out multiple uh, signals and not only the strongest one. I think that would be a, a generic definition. Basically, a transceiver which allows a proper marking function needs to be able to recognize the signal pattern, the transmit signal pattern of multiple signals. And uh, th this is visible when a transceiver has a list of buried subjects where you see with several little main icons the amount of buried subjects. Not only a digital indicator, it's single burial or it is multiple burial. No, a device which allows to show you you have two or you have three which uh, requires in the background true, um, true pattern recognition and which allows to, um, to differentiate between the signals of buried subject number one, buried subject number two, buried subject number three, buried subject number four. And this is then the base of a true marking function. Great, and yeah. most manufacturers offer this today, huh? Yeah, I do believe they were referring to signal suppression. Um, so that, that, does, that does answer that question. Yeah, signal suppression is not a true marking function. Great. Other questions, Ethan? 
if you could touch uh, briefly while we wait for any other final questions to come in on uh, your thoughts on airbags versus Avalon or neither. Yeah. Um, the, the base of the, I can uh, make here maybe now reference to the mountainsafety.info content. I share my screen again with you. While you're pulling that up, we did just get one more retaining to the UIA list. He's, this uh, gentleman's asking if there are no BCA transceivers, shovels, or probes on the list currently, and is there a reason for that? And uh, it is look, the UIAA standards are um, not. It, there is no legal requirement in a market to. Uh, fulfill the UIAA safety label standards to be sold. In Europe, we have uh, legally enforced standards uh, from CEN, uh, the European uh, Normative Commission. In the, um, in the United States, as far as I know, uh, there are no binding standards on um, transceivers, probes, or shovels. In Europe, there are also legally binding standards on transceivers because we have a legally enforced standard on avalanche transceivers. And if you don't fulfill the standard of the European Communication Standardization Institute, then you cannot sell your transceiver. Concerning shovel and probes, there are no legally uh, binding standards either, but they are the UIAA standards. Um, Within the UIAA standards, because there is no legal enforcement, every ma manufacturer can choose himself if uh, he is interested to, to certify the product. I mean, it leads as well to, to cost. Uh, it, it makes as well uh, the um, development more expensive. To have certified uh, products is not uh, is not cheap. We see that as well with the products which are today on the market, especially the light shovels. Light shovels uh, a few years ago were many very cheap shovels on the market, and many of them were really bad in quality. Uh, today, the light light shovels which fulfill the standard, they cost more. And when you talk to the manufacturers, they say as well, yes, it's, it's more work uh, to uh, develop the product to fulfill the standard. You have to take uh, more expensive uh, materials. Uh, you cannot just take the cheapest alloy. Then the certification itself costs money. So, um, yeah, it's a strategic decision of a manufacturer if you want to uh, go towards uh, certification or not, in particular, if there is no legal enforcement of the standard. So here, uh, when we are in, on mountainsafety.info, we see, by the way, as well, the, um, the personal rescue equipment part with the minimum requirements on the transceiver, three antennas marking function. Here, uh, from next year on, it will say, preferably with UIAA safety label, as it says today already for the shovels. Now, we uh, had the question about the additional safety equipment. And when we speak about the additional safety equipment, then, We quickly find this puzzle part so that uh, you see as well where you uh, can find such information. Duck. 
Or... So we have uh, the transceiver probe and shovel. Then very important is as well things like reliable communication devices. Um, in the European Alps, um, cell phone coverage as well in the mountains is excellent. When I drove today uh, a little bit north of the town of Ketchum, I realized that my cell phone very soon, much sooner than I anticipated, um, had no more coverage. So in North America to have a reliable communication device is very important when it is about survival chances, because even when you are able to um, to search and dig out the buried subject quickly, there's still a good chance that the patient already has developed a severe medical problem or is as well severely injured. Um, very quickly, you will be reliant on external help, on professional external help, and to be able to alert them quickly so that they can come to you quickly so that they uh, understand very precisely where you are it's important, very important for the survival chances of the buried object. So uh, for you, probably satellite-based communication devices, very important for spot devices. Then um, <clears throat> first aid kit, cold protection is very important. And when you want to further reduce uh, personally your um, your uh, likelihood for to die or for a severe injury, then we foremost have to look into avalanche airbags, avalanche airbags, uh, which are available today from many manufacturers. And um, they have become much more affordable and much more lightweight in the last 10 to 15 years. The Avalon, which you have mentioned before, is not even produced anymore by the original manufacturer. Um, the decrease in price for the airbags and the decrease in weight for the airbags has been so considerable that the Avalon has uh, yeah, lost ground. It is not that it was a bad idea, but it is as well, of course, much more complex than uh, to trigger the inflation of an avalanche airbag when you have to take this mouse piece of the Avalon into the mouse in this very delicate moment where uh, you realize the avalanche uh, has broken loose to keep the mouse piece of the Avalon in the mouse while you are transported down slope. There were obviously successful cases, but only very few. So it was never really possible to calculate an evidence level for the reduction of mortality for the Avalon. Today, when you expose yourself a lot to avalanche hazard, uh, which means uh, when you are often in the mountains in slopes steeper than 30 degrees in the winter, then it's highly recommended uh, to use an avalanche airbag, especially when you have uh, when you live in a place, uh, yeah, like here where the snowpack is, is yeah, quite complex. Um, you, you are not in a maritime snowpack. Your uh, snowpack has, uh, is often quite, uh, quite shallow. It is cold. So very soon you have uh, a complex snowpack. Complex snowpacks have certain uncertainties. Um, and therefore, to have a device which considerably re uh, reduces the mortality in case um, there is an avalanche totally makes sense. An airbag, however, does not uh, protect you from head injury. Therefore, as well, a helmet is a very uh, important addition to probe, shovel, and transceiver. As well, in an avalanche, you can crash into something, and then only a helmet is designed to properly protect your head. This is the recommendation I highly recommend the use of, of airbags. And, um, what is maybe here important to know when you are left-handed, only buy an airbag, which allows you to mount the, re the release handle uh, on, the, on the right side, uh, because uh, left-handed people can only reliably trigger 
the um, handle which is on the right shoulder whereas right-handed people can only reliably trigger and apply the force it needs to pull when the handle is on the left shoulder. What uh, model you, exp uh, you exactly uh, prefer then? It's as well a little bit uh, personal preference. There are manufacturers which offer uh, models where the expensive airbag system is uh, either separate from uh, the backpack or um, the other way around where you buy the expensive airbag system once and then with the zipper system you can put on backpacks with different volumes that in my perspective makes sense because uh, depending what you do you need either only a very small day pack or a larger uh, backpack and when you only have to buy the the airbag system once and can then transform it into a backpack with uh, different uh, volumes that that is for me um, an important um, an important addition of the functionality yeah great thank you uh, it looks like we are done with the questions from the audience so i know you've had a long day today manuel and we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us as well as the avalanche safety community at large. And um, we wish you luck in your class and your time here. And, and thank you again for your time. And we'll let uh, Amy take us out. Perfect. Thank you uh, very much for uh, those ones of you um, who still have some questions or you want to learn more. I would quickly like to make reference to the mountainsafety.info web page. This is where um, you can find more information about avalanche rescue and from next season on as well, avalanche prevention. We have today um, the topics avalanche rescue, avalanche uh, medicine, mountain emergency medicine, and here in the future as well, avalanche prevention and risk management. When you click, for example, on the avalanche rescue topic, uh, you can filter here by topic and you find many additional information on avalanche rescue and avalanche rescue equipment. I wish you a good continuation of the winter season and have a nice evening. Thank you so much, Manuel. I definitely learned a lot. And thank you, Ethan, for um, fielding some questions. Um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we'd also like to send our gratitude to Rocky Mountain Hardware for being our sponsors of this evening's Digging Deeper talk. And just a friendly reminder that you could win a new transceiver beacon, or yeah, transceiver or a beacon, same thing. <laughs> you could win a new beacon, shovel, and probe by entering our social media contest um, to just show how you're practicing your avalanche rescue techniques and tag Sawtooth Abbey. And we will be doing a drawing each week and then the grand prize will be at our avalanche awareness week um, that ends on March 1st. So you've got some time, it doesn't have to be fancy and you can learn or use some of the new techniques you maybe you picked up tonight. So thanks everyone. And again, thank you Manuel and Ethan and a shout out to Scott Savage. We see in the corner back there. <laughs> All right, and we will see you at the next Digging Deeper on February 23rd for likely a topic about online mapping with Onyx Backcountry. <laughs>